I'd like to introduce our presenters. We have Jeremy Gouvier and Andrew Lynch. Jeremy is a principal engineer here at MN Optics and has over 20 years of prototyping and custom design experience. He holds a graduate certificate in project management from the New Jersey Institute of Technology and a BS in optics from the University of Rochester. Andrew is EO's own expert rapid prototyping solutionist. He has over a decade of domestic and international technical sales experience. As a result, he has worked with numerous customers to identify unique prototyping solutions. He holds a BS in Physics and Astronomy from the University of Rochester. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy and Andrew. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's great to be speaking with all of you today. This is Andrew Lynch here kicking things off, but Jeremy and I will be handing off to each other throughout the webinar. There's a lot to cover, so let's get going. First, why rapid optical prototyping? Well, put simply, the world we live in is moving fast, very fast. New technologies are developed and introduced at a breakneck pace, and let's face it, most exciting tech developments these days need to use optics. 3D printing is now a ubiquitous game changer for prototyping in general, and is probably the most familiar and accessible to most of you out there. But let's talk about how optical prototyping can keep pace. Which brings us to our simple agenda. Now, this will not be your typical webinar where the punches are held back, so to speak. This will be a fast-paced webinar where we cover a creative hack every one or two minutes. As you can see on the agenda, the hacks will proceed through a few buckets, standard, modified standard, and fully custom, just to help organize our coverage of what we call the full solution space spectrum. Speaking of the solution space spectrum, here's what we mean. Too often we see customers with the not invented here syndrome only considering fully custom options. However, if you surveyed all suppliers out there, I'd estimate there's probably over 100,000 unique stock optical components out there. So my message, leverage them whenever you can. Notice the benefits in speed here. If you're worried about controls, uh, perhaps FDA controls, change control, configuration control, getting inspection reports, things like that, ask. Uh, EO is actually very familiar with these requirements and, and implements these controls rather frequently. With that overview and context behind us, I'm now going to turn things over to Jeremy to take us through the first six hacks for prototyping with standard components. So take it away, Jeremy. Thank you, Andrew. So this first hack, number one, is one that is really essential for off-the-shelf optics or standard products, but is also incredibly useful for even your custom design. And that's going monochromatic. If you can narrow your wave bands, not use broadband light, you'll be able to greatly simplify the design and the prototyping of your optical solution. Now, as humans, we like to think in color. We prefer images that are in color. So it's usually not our first thought when we're looking at a design to try to get rid of the color. However, for most applications, color information isn't really adding anything to your, uh, to your application. And you want to, and you'll be perfectly fine just eliminating that, bringing it down to monochromatic to make it more simple. Quick example here is even in something where we're sorting for color, Using broadband illumination doesn't necessarily really help you at all. So we have green and red pills here, trying to sort them out. Middle image here is what it looks like on black and white camera with white light, very low contrast. They all look gray. Maybe you could discern this with your algorithm. Slight changes in lighting will, will make that impossible, though. However, we make this monochromatic by just inserting a green filter into the system we can very easily tell the red from the, the green. They're black and gray now instead of gray on gray and get very good contrast, very simply. Hack number two is how you can use PCX lenses to do more complicated design replacements for things that a simple form like PCX may not be your first thought of how to eliminate your aberration. So to start off with, off the shelf, vast majority of your options are going to be things that are designed for what we call infinite conjugate, or collimated light coming into it and coming to a focus on the other side. So they're in a, a shape that will be 
reducing your sphere collaboration with that type of conjugate. However, that's not you typically where you're going to need your lenses to be. So if you need some other type of bending or shape to your lens than the common PCX, here's a couple ways you can get around that. One is just using two PCX lenses, putting them plano side to plano side, you can make yourself a DCX lens that doesn't have the same radius on both sides. And there's thousands of options off the shelf of different radii to choose with PCX lenses to be able to find a combination that is going to be close to what your original design is. The other option is trying to break your system into a series of infinite conjugate sub assemblies. So here we have an example of a 2x relay. So you've got a close conjugate on both sides of your optics, not the kind of situation that a single PCX is really well suited for. However, using two PCX lenses with infinite conjugate in between the two, you can take that focus, collimate it, then take that collimation and bring it to a focus on the other side while eliminating or at least greatly reducing your spherical aberration. For hack three, I'm going to take a little bit different direction. Those first hacks were around optical components and using off-the-shelf components, but you should really look at the broader picture of options out there and consider off-the-shelf assemblies and how you can use those in your applications as well. So what, what we have for off-the-shelf options in assemblies are things like machine vision lenses, photographic lenses, microscope objectives. Now often, if you're doing something in that microscope type range where you have a greater than one magnification in your imaging, there aren't a lot of options for what your magnifications can be. The microscope objectives and the systems out there are typically at set magnifications like 4x, 5x, 10x, and 20. But if you need something a little bit different or you need some customization to it, here's a way that you can get around that. So if we take a machine vision lens, like our C-series imaging lens here, these are fixed focal length lenses, and we show on the left-hand side your object to the left, your image to the right, typical ways this lens is being used. However, if you flip that around backwards and now have the C-mount side of the lens towards your object, you can use this much like a microscope objective and get something that's a higher than one magnification. So here we, we show it as a 3x magnifier using an off-the-shelf lens. These have some advantage over a microscope objective in being more customizable, getting different magnifications. You also can control your numerical apertures. These lenses will typically have an iris in them that you can adjust. So you can find the right balance of light collection, resolution, and depth of field. Now in that same vein of using assemblies, hack number four is a way that you can use a component to modify a optical assembly to make it maybe a little different magnification or work at a slightly different conjugate than what the assembly itself was designed for. In this example, we're going to go to a video microscope type application where you need a little bit different magnification. So we're using a 10x Mitsutoya objective, which collimates the light coming off of your object, and then normally is refocused using a 200 millimeter tube lens. In this case, we want to make a little bit higher mag system, say a 12 and a half X, so we can hold these components all together in a cage system, and instead of the 200 millimeter tube lens, we'll just use an off-the-shelf Acromat, the 250 millimeter focal length, held in the cage system to get your right spacing and bring that image to a camera. And now you have 12 and a half, 12 and a half X magnifying system that you've made with combination of off-the-shelf components. Now, we mentioned the cage system. That's one way of doing some quick prototyping optomechanics. There's also things like C-mount and S-mount tubes that you can use to hold your optics that have some advantages over things like the cage system of getting better concentricities and, and making your, your assembly a little easier. But they also have some difficulties to them of 
not being able to get exact spacings you're going to want, not being able to get your optics very close. So there's some new options out there in these tube systems that let you have more flexibility in how you're going to hold your optics in there. And that's what we call the inner diameter threaded prototyping tubes. So these are similar type tubes as the C-mount ones, but instead of the lens being held on a seat and then retained into place, the entire tube is threaded on the inside, and you use a series of retainers to act as both the seat for your optic and the retainer. So this allows you to place the optic precisely where you want in the tube, retain it, and then place another optic either right at the end of that retainer for it to be very close, or with a third retainer as another seat. These systems take a little bit more care to set up. You'll probably want to use a depth gauge to get exactly the right position for your retainers before you put your optics in, but can be a lot more flexible than other off-the-shelf optics, or off-the-mechanics, rather, and a lot quicker than making your own custom barrel. For hack number six, we'd be remiss in a quick turn prototyping to not mention 3D printing. Now typically for optomechanics, the types of tolerancing you're going to need aren't really going to be achieved by using a commercial 3D printer. You're going to need much better concentricities and positional tolerances, the kinds of things you would get using a lathe to turn your metal. However, with some creativity and using other systems like the cage systems in conjunction with 3D printing, you can get a lot of flexibility and still the precision you need. When doing this, consider how you're going to align your optics and try to put some adjustment into your system, things like flexures or fine adjustments in your XY position for your optics as you're putting them together. Also think where you can use the 3D printed parts as things like shims and spacers on a otherwise very concentric tube system that you have. And many of these options are already freely available, open source, on lots of online repositories. So that'll bring the end of our standard component hacks, and I'll pass things back over to my colleague Andrew to start talking about modified standards. Thanks, Jeremy. So hack number seven focuses on the lowly window. Uh, arguably the simplest op optical component, windows are often overlooked as starting points because, let's face it, they're kind of boring. However, we, we shouldn't forget that it's really windows that are the basis of a multitude of other components, be it other windows or adding coatings to turn it into a mirror, a filter, a plate-style beam splitter, or otherwise. Uh, bottom line is, try to find a stock window that gets you 80 to 90 percent of the way there and you're off to a great start in terms of cost and lead time. You might be able to leverage a simple window that was manufactured in lots of 200 to 300 pieces at a much, much reduced cost, uh, and then simply apply a coating onto it to get your, your custom optic quickly and at a discounted cost. Hack number eight actually also builds on windows of sorts. Many optical systems experience some level of aberrations, which results in loss of image quality and overall system performance. Most common is spherical, which can actually be compensated for by using spherical aberration compensator plates near the stop of your system. Edmund Optics actually sells standard spherical aberration plates in increments of plus or minus a quarter wave, plus or minus half wave, and plus or minus full wave. And custom versions can be created for spherical aberration plates or other aberration plates as well. So this is something to consider leveraging window substrates for as well. Hack number nine is similar to modifying windows, but there are some unique twists here as well. Other than the obvious modifications like edge downs, truncate cuts, hole drilling, or mounting, there's a couple other really interesting things that you can consider for modifying spherical elements. Uh, one of which is adding a, a mirror coating to a concave lens to make it a focusing mirror. Uh, a custom focusing mirror. Although my, my personal favorite is the concept of actually taking a plano convex lens off the shelf and then asphorizing the surface. This is a very quick and economical way to make a custom asphere 
that frankly not enough designers are taking advantage of. So a very powerful way, similar, similar analog here to the Windows, being able to take a $20 component off the shelf that was manufactured in volume, adding minutes up to an hour or so of labor, uh, maybe a couple hours of setup and labor, and getting a custom A-sphere very, very quickly and very economically. Now the prior hacks in this section were all component level, but hack number 10 relates to imaging lens assemblies. Modified standard, this whole concept, does not have to be limited to components. Uh, in assemblies, metal changes tend to be the easiest and quickest uh, changes you can make, especially for things like changing apertures or F number, changing mechanical interfaces, perhaps removing irises and focus adjustments to either miniaturize the lens, uh, make it a smaller envelope, or even to ruggedize the lens uh, to make it survive shock and vibe environments or ensure pointing stability after calibration, and, and so on. Uh, one of the next easiest changes is to actually change around air spacing. So change around metal uh, components and spacers, change the air spacings between the elements, and or to change up the coatings on the elements to maximize performance at a given wavelength or at a given working distance. So that completes our, our modified standard hacks. Now we'll dive right into our hacks for fully custom prototyping. Hack number 11 is really more of a public service announcement of sorts. As you're designing and proof of concepting and prototyping, please, please, please leverage your supplier of choice early and often. Uh, as long as they are the manufacturer of what they sell, or not all are, any supplier really worth their salt should be able to give you invaluable feedback in terms of manufacturability, spec trades, and cost or lead time savings ideas. Um, so really the, the takeaway here is rather than locking down your design and your drawings before talking to anyone and simply sending out for RFQ, uh, consider having those conversations first, gain that knowledge uh, from one or more of your suppliers then lock down your, your design and drawings after taking into account that feedback. And uh, now I'm going to turn it back to Jeremy to walk us through the last two hacks. Okay, when, before we move on, I just want to add a little bit to this hack because it's personally one of my favorite ones. This is something I often do with a lot of our customers, and I've found that while a lot of people don't think of this initially, once they have tried it and talked with the supplier early on in the design, it becomes a habit very quickly. And a lot of the customers that I work with, once we've worked on, on a design once, they'll come back and we'll talk about every new design. And it's the kind of thing we can do very quickly and easily and give them a lot of insight on their design. For hack number 12, consider what your vendor's tolerances are. And all of the, the optics manufacturers nowadays have a similar chart to this one here, and we have several depending on the type of optics we're talking about. This example is a spherical, but there's ones for A-spheres and Plano as well. There's three groupings on these, a kind of good, better, and the best we can do column. The commercial, the first one there on the left, is really the kind of cheapest that you'll be able to get. Anything looser than these tolerances really aren't going to save you any money because these are the tolerances that we'll be able to hit without really trying. There isn't scrap, so we're not really getting rid of any parts that, with, that are looser than these. The middle column is where the manufacturer likes to work. These are a little bit more expensive because there's a little bit more scrap in it, but it's where they're comfortable working and where they're doing their best work. The last column, this is really the limits of what you can do. Now while the first two columns are your kind of set menu, you can order a part that is a commercial quality or a precision quality and just apply all these tolerances and it's a good shorthand to use when describing the parts you want. For the high precision or the limits of what you can do, you really want to treat that more like an a la carte menu and only tighten the tolerances that need to be tightened to there because each individual line is going to be adding cost. And it does so in kind of a multiplicative fashion, fashion so that the more you add, your prices are going to increase significantly. And the last little bit of advice on this hack is 
there are certain tolerances that you just can't have in the last column together. These are tolerances that fight each other. A good example of this is thickness and your figure tolerances like your power and irregularity. To hit a tight power and irregularity tolerance, we need to do iterative polishing that's going to make the thicknesses vary more. So you can't have both a very tight thickness and a very tight power tolerance. For hack number three, this is one that we go into a lot more detail in a prior webinar that our colleague Nathan did. And you can find on our website at edmanoptics.com slash spherical dash tolerancing. But I'm going to go into this a little bit quickly and without all of the math that we went in in the other one. And this is just some general tricks for designing for manufacturability. Things to consider in your design are things like spring ratio or how flexible the lens is going to be. You make a lens very thin compared to its diameter. And there's a rough rule of thumb, somewhere between 10 to 20 as a ratio of diameter to thickness. You can't get as tight of figure tolerances on that, so your part's going to spring or flex while we're polishing it and make more irregularity end up on your part. Having concentric radii, or where the centers of curvatures of your front and back of your lens fall very close to each other, within a millimeter of each other, is also another thing to avoid because it can make centering your lens extremely difficult. And along the lines of centering is something we call the Z factor or the centerability or sometimes called the carol of the lens. And this is the idea of how sharp your curvatures or curvatures are relative to each other so that they can be belt chucked very simply and get auto centering to occur. And the last part of this is consider your edge thickness of your lens. Whenever the edge thickness gets thinner than about 0.7 millimeters, your odds of getting chipping during the polishing go up dramatically. And one of the mistakes a lot of designers make is they, earn, they learn very on, early on in their career about avoiding this edge thickness problem, but they do so looking at it only at the finished diameter of the lens. You actually want to consider the diameter of the lens that it is while it's being polished, which is typically one millimeter larger than your finished diameter. So those were our 13 hacks. Hopefully, at least a few of these were something new and informative for you and will help make your next prototyping job a lot more easy and cost effective. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Andrew. Great hacks. Um, please note we still have a team of expert engineers answering the questions you've submitted in Q&A. They'll continue to answer your questions even after the webinar has concluded. And additionally, we answered many of your questions during the webinar, and, and there were a few common and notable ones that came up that I think are worth sharing. Um, the first one, which, which came up quite a bit, and I'm going to direct this one at you, Jeremy, is how can I get prescription files for your lenses? Okay. For any of our tech spec lenses, be it the components or the assemblies, we offer the prescription files so that you can better integrate them into your design. For any of our components on our website, if you go to the product pages, the ZMAX files are right there for you to download directly off the website. For any of the tech spec assemblies, like our machine vision lenses, we have a form on the website that you can find by searching prescription requests. And then one of our application engineers will contact you with the black box for that lens so that you can also integrate that into your final application. Great. Thank you. This next one, um, Andrew, can, can you elaborate more on typical lead times across the solution space spectrum? Sure, I'm happy to take that one as I kind of glossed over that during the slide. But lead times will obviously vary widely. Uh, but in general, for first for stock components, if showing in stock on the, the Edmonopics website, for example, uh, and the vast majority of our 26,000 plus stock products are, uh, then we'll ship those same day if, if ordered by 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so you could literally have it on your desk the next day if you, if you overnight read it. Not all suppliers carry as much inventory or show the latest availability, so just take care uh, and, and be sure to confirm those. But you can get stock components in general rather quickly. For modified standard, um, simple mechanical modifications are the easiest. You can usually get those done in days, so those are your your slice and dices, your edge downs, your truncate cuts and drilling holes and things like that. If you're going to do something like a custom coating 
uh, then I would prepare yourself more for maybe a one or two week turnaround somewhere in that ballpark. And then for fully custom, it's, it's really all over the map. Um, traditional optics lead times can, believe it or not, stretch from 8 to 12 to 16 weeks sometimes, depending on, on capacity uh, or, or busyness. But uh, I, I can share that most of Edmund Optics' first releases, whether for first article uh, lots or even just the initial release off a blanket order, most of our components are actually now at about a six-week lead time. Um, so very, very competitive there. And we actually can go faster at a premium, and others can out there in the market as well. Uh, just be careful, right, because there are some pretty steep premiums out there, depending on truly how fast you need. Uh, but I know here we, we currently are entertaining, you know, a few week turnarounds on rapid spherical prototyping. So, but there's quite a spectrum out there. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, thanks again to, to both of you, Jeremy and Andrew. That, I think that about covers it. And thank you, everyone, for joining. On behalf of Edmund Optics, we appreciate you being here. Uh, just a reminder, a link to today's recording will be sent to all participants shortly. You can also reach us via email, the Edmund Optics 1-800 number, or through the live chat feature on our website. Thanks again for everyone for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time.